don't. We need to live up to our title of being the secret history of the Troubles and the way to do that is to keep on saying to ourselves what really happened. To go and do it like you've never done it before. For two years, the BBC Spotlight team have been making a series of new documentaries to mark the 50th anniversary of the start of the Troubles. When you start this interview, yes. you are only talking to me. This is During the, the making of this seven-part series, reporters, producers, even the bosses have been filmed. Yeah, I understand that, I understand that. I won't say where they came from. This film shows how investigative journalism works. I know the story you want, and that is a story that we're, we're, trying, we're trying to get. We don't have a huge amount of time, and we have a massive task. <laughs> how did we persuade people to speak out? This dance has been going on for months and months and months. And how did we uncover long-hidden secrets? It's actually quite nerve-wracking ringing them because there's always that fear that you'll blow it, you know? British intelligence, MI5, MI6, would review the material. Are you certain of that? Yes. Is everything plugged? Yeah. He's going right in. OK, Mandy, you ready? Secret and personal to Kelvin. I can't believe I forgot that question to Stephen. See, this is why I don't want you to go to uh, to Cardiff for that, me, because I'm just thinking, what if she misses a crucial question like that again? Yeah, and you're not awake to catch it. You were my second line of defence. I was very ill that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last night, two brothers were shot dead in front of their 11-year-old sister. They've been named as Rory and Gerard Cairns, who were 18 and 22. We're investigating the murders of two young brothers in 1993. The Loyalist paramilitaries, the UVF, claimed the killings at the time. But no one was convicted. The murderers are still out there. The last photo of the boys alive is this beautiful, happy, smiling photo around the birthday cake. It's Roisin's 11th birthday party, which makes it even more heartbreaking. And they were dead 20 minutes after that photo was taken. We're trying to piece together what happened that night, what led up to the shooting and who was behind it. And why has no one ever been convicted? In the early 1970s, the first generation of IRA devices were crude. Like, for example, you know, you had uh, anti-personnel bombs were just kind of a handful of kind of nails kind of wrapped around a lump of plastic that was detonated by lighting a fuse. Whereas at this stage in 1979, it's more sophisticated. The Libyan story is, is the detail in terms of the, the story here. Do you think you're going to get anywhere with that? Because that, that I am is... trying. I mean, there is there are a few people and kind of don't want to go into detail on camera, but um, there are key people who could unlock this, and um, I'm close to getting close to them. People are very nervous, as you know, of because it's a huge thing to get those. Yeah, camera, yeah. The first thing you learn about Northern Ireland when you investigate it is that almost nobody tells the truth. It's referred to as a dirty war, but it was first and foremost a secret war, and nothing is as it seems. This is where I climb into this cupboard and, and then come out in a couple of months. Dun, dun, dun. It's been a good couple of years since I looked through these folders. I think there are names of people that I need to check if they are still um, alive and well and try and speak to. There's some secrets to be uncovered, and just have to, just have to be, you know? Just like, what else would you be doing on a Friday evening? The big challenge for me is trying to find out something new. There is 
a clear difference between supporting the just cause of nations struggling for their freedom and liberation, between that and terrorism. The IRA's main source of weapons were the United States and Libya, but in terms of their capacity to be a military um, force on par as they would see it with the British Army, it was the material that they obtained from Libya which changes, changes everything for them in the 80s. So this was Abdus Salam Jaloud. He is the man that was second in command to Gaddafi for decades. Would have been across the support to the IRA. It would be amazing to have a Libyan who was part of his regime bring you inside that world at that time. I mean, that is the goal. I mean, that's what you want. You know, you want a first-hand account. We're visiting the Kearns family to find out more about Rory and Jared, about what happened that night, and also to find out more about the journey that these people have been on for 25 years, trying to find out what happened to their sons. We never got to, to drive. It. Mm -hmm. it must be so nice to kind of hold the things that they were. Ah, oh, yes, yes, that they had, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I kept them in the house. Yeah. But you'd think they would be safer in their well, house in their than anywhere house. else in their yeah, own home. Yeah. Rory was sitting exactly here. He was sitting where I'm sitting. Yes, exactly. On the first bullet that went through Rory, out here, and back up through the centre of his mm. head. Mm. He never stood uh, a chance. No, no. no. They were clearly uh, very, very experienced killers. Oh, they were. Yeah. They were definitely, yes, yes. 1993, Martina Navarralova was so popular. Oh, she was. She really, really was, wasn't she? And he picked the card. Yes, he picked the card. So this was the specks of blood. But I think it's precious, you know. Oh, very precious. You know, that's the bullet went through his name. Right through his name. These killings were part of a series of murders in Mid-Ulster that for some reason have remained unsolved. Thank you. I will do my best and keep up with Oh, OK. In order to try and get to the truth, you have to deal with the people on the other side. And that is a real head melt. In the 1990s, Lawrence Maguire was a gunman for a paramilitary group called the Ulster Volunteer Force, the same group that killed Rory and Gerard Kearns. I'm going to sort out the stuff with a car now to get it all set up. But do you guys want to go and have some breakfast and uh, just have a chat about stuff just generally? And yeah. then I'll call you when we're ready. Listen, thanks for doing this, Lawrence. Um, I think the families that we're, that we're talking to, all they want is the truth. And, you know, if you can help them get that, I mean, let's see what we can do. So it's fighting answers for them and for myself. You were the first person convicted of directing terrorism in the UK. What would you say to those to the to the families of those people that you killed? Is there anything you think that you can say to them? I don't think anything would justify, you know, what's happened. Do you think it was worth it? I don't know, to be honest with you. Lawrence was in prison when the boys were murdered. But he must know something. Bonjour, Paul Ah, uh, super, thank you. Um, I am uh, sending a letter to one of your residents, and I just wanted to check that um, he's registered there before I send the letter. His name is Monsieur Jaloud. Okay, thank you so much for your help. Great, thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. So we know that he uh, is based in Paris. We're told that he frequents this hotel quite often. So we have a letter in French and a letter in Arabic to send over. I really, really hope that we get to meet him in person and try and get some information from him. Hey, 
you know who your target is. And you know what to do. We found this film from the 1970s, made by an American documentary crew. It's called The Secret Army. Never seen it before. I don't know anyone who's ever seen it before. So it's kind of strange that it slipped under the radar like this. There's senior IRA people being interviewed unmasked, and they have access to IRA members doing all kinds of things, including carrying out attacks. Pretty sure that's Martin McGinnis right there. This is incredibly rare footage of Martin McGinnis, who goes on to become Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. Um, he's handling guns, he's driving around Derry showing bullets to children. I've got to show Dara this section of the film and see what he thinks. Is this for real? Yep. Yeah. That was Martin there, wasn't it? Yeah. So that's Jalik now, isn't it? With the um, yeah. fertilizer to make it a very big bomb, yeah. The black stuff. It's extraordinary stuff, isn't it? Oh, yeah. There he is. There he is again, yeah. yeah. So, the car drives off. The car drives off, you can see yeah, the registration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 7337UI. There was a bomb in Shipkey Street about the 20th of March, something like that, 72. So Chris found these pictures in the Dairy Journal of that bomb. I can see something. There's the red plate. Yeah. Good. That guy's taking a picture from the box, an old box camera. And that's him That's there. the picture. So it's a real bomb. Yeah. So on, on the face of it, you have an IRA bomb attack led by Mark McGuinness. Yeah. On the face of it, without, I mean, he, I, he mightn't get past, um, past yeah. a jury on this, but I mean, that's what it looks like. Yeah. You would think if the police or army had seen Mark McGuinness doing what he's doing here, they would have arrested him. We don't know why it was made and why it seemed to just disappear after it was made. The producer was a man named John Boyer Bell who written a book by the same name about the IRA. He died about 15 years ago. We need Dara to go to America to work out some of the unanswered questions behind this film. I think those are all big, big reveals. We have you wanted to go through the structure, that's what we're doing. We have made huge strides last week. We have we spoken did. to people nobody else have got near. I mean, all right, let's move can we on just to rest that. for five minutes? I was prepared to kill from the start. So I was, because I seen it was the only way forward. I still can't believe that we've managed to get the first ever television interview with Lawrence McGuire. Just broke into the guy's house. I think I was in every bedroom before I seen him, the target. And that was the first one I ever done. You killed him, man? Aye, aye. Shot him three times. I'm just going through the transcripts now. Sometimes I forget, and in this house you have really blood-curdling books beside children's dictionaries and something. I keep forgetting to pick my books up. Hold on. I mark everything. It's a well-worn Bible. We have Lawrence McGuire saying on camera there were three main killers, there were three main shooters in the, in, in the Mid-Ulster UVF. One of them was me, as in Lawrence McGuire. He went down, he was convicted. The other one was Mark Fulton, Swinger Fulton, uh, Billy Wright's deputy. 
he was, he was convicted, but he is dead. And he said the third man was very quiet. The only time you ever saw him when he, was when he was going to kill. He didn't take any money for, you know, there was a pot, you know, where they were, you know, throwing a bit of money out for a successful hit. He never took the money. He never, he just did his business, did his work, and then he left. And, uh, and I said to Lauren, so you tell me that there, there's someone out there who's, um, you know, who, who you know killed about 15 people who, um, and he went, yeah, no, he didn't say the name, but what I'm hoping is there is more paperwork, more evidence that I'm hoping is gonna come in in the next couple of weeks. Claire's our assistant producer. She's been gathering up every document relating to these murders. What hasn't been fully fed in to this yet right. is the So this is the master. Days. It's kind of a bit of a quick guide to each case and any paperwork. We're reviewing every scrap of paperwork, every court document in relation to those convicted of any involvement with the Mid-Ulster murders. This guy goes down for being the driver on the night of the murder. Mm -hmm. He puts Alan Oliver as, as the gunman. Yeah, he names him as the gunman throughout. I mean, who is Alan Oliver? So the appeal judge says, in this case, Harper and Oliver set out to commit murder. Murder was committed by Oliver and Harper's guilt is thereby established yeah. as the backup driver. So how come he went to prison and Oliver didn't? Bonjour, hello. Just one moment. So I've made contact with Jalud, I've spoken to him a couple of times, and there's an agreement to meet in Paris. So I'm going to give Abdesalam Jalud a call. Look, he is the main reason why, you know, I came to Paris to track him down. Hello, Mr. Jalud. It's Jennifer, Jennifer, the journalist from the BBC. I, and I came to Paris t to meet you. Um, so I, I sent you a text of where I'm staying. But it, it's not for recording. It's, it's literally just, just, a, just a meeting. Okay, well, look, I'll, I'll speak to you. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you later, okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, that was super disappointing because um, when I spoke to him last week and the week before, he was agreeable to meet. Um, look, it's clearly somebody who's very uh, mindful of his security. I'll try him again later on. I'll send him a detailed text message of what I'm doing. I do know the cafe where he, he hangs out in Paris, so we will go there and try and track him down that way. Hello, Mr. Jalud. If you can give me a call back on this number. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Like, this is the gig. It's, like, it's not easy, and it's um, particularly when you're dealing with a secret organisation in terms of the IRA and the people who don't want to talk about what they used to do within the Gaddafi regime. So, like, it's a, it's a double whammy of, um, of barriers. There are avenues to pursue in terms of the Libyan story. I am more motivated now to get the Irish side to, to speak to me about the Libyan arms shipments. Just for today, shorts. Dara's in America at the minute. He's trying to work out why no one has ever heard of this film before. This is Sean McStuffin, who's the IRA chief of staff at the time. And he's talking about how he goes about his work. We have men and women from all walks of life in our organization, 
We, we have people with university degrees, we have people who have just finished primary school. We're trying to find some indication, any indication, that this film had a life beyond the process of making it. And I found a couple of mentions, um, but they're pretty obscure. And this, this particular ad here, this notice here says that it's going to be shown in the gymnasium of St. Philip Neri Church School here in New York. What's the ice going to cross? It was never shown in Ireland, never shown in the UK, never shown even in America, apart from these, a couple of showings like, like here at St. Philip Neri School in the Bronx to an Irish language society. But that's it. You have to wonder why, you have to wonder. Once you start wondering why, you have to think it's because of the footage it had of the IRA. You insert that in the sticky jelly knife, making a hole through it here with a non-metal object. I'm trying to check on a, an FOIA request I made in um, at the end of 2017. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you very much. OK, bye, bye. The producer of the of the Secret Army, John Boyer Bell, we established he had a relationship with the CIA um, from CIA records that have been opened up under Freedom of Information. So I've asked for all their records on him. Boyer Bell had a, had a, uh, had quite an international reputation as an academic expert on um, terrorism and insurgencies and they seem to draw on his expertise quite a bit. Was Boyer Bell working for the CIA while he's filming the IRA in Derry? And if that's the case, was he making the film for them? Was this some kind of intelligence operation to see who members of the IRA were? So it turns out that there's a friend of Boyer Bell's in Los Angeles. This man's name is Roberto Matrotti. Maybe Roberto can tell us about Boyer Bell's intelligence connections. Hello, hey, hello. Hi. Roberto. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Thank you very much come for in, uh, agreeing to, to meet and chat. That was, it's fun. I mean, plus you guys uh, coming from so far away, I mean, making, making this fabulous trip. Well, that's you deserve a lot of attention. Oh, thank you A lot of much. respect. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, there he is. Well, okay. They used to be this big. So you filmed this? Yeah, I filmed it. Yeah, so we have a bit of him. Yeah, okay. What is the building here, this one? Well, that came out as a, someone who was interned in the 50s. I was simply showing them to you because the Republican world is invisible, if you know, except if you know what to look at. How did he feel about his, the fact that his 1972 film was seen by virtually no one? How did you feel about that? He was extremely upset and he was really mad because the reason why the film was not seen, it was, it was a political, po political interference from the UK with the, an American network, <laughs> which was ready to do it. And that, he felt, was, again, a part of the game. Did he know? tell you that? Yeah. He said that the UK government on some level yeah. stopped it being shown. Yeah. I don't know how much was recreated. I assume that it was all real because knowing Bo, uh, he wouldn't, uh, you know, all this was for capturing yes. the real thing. But he worked with the CIA. Yes, and that is really where he walked a very fine line, you know, but he never betrayed the trust. I think that's Dale's, Dale's long, isn't it? We have, uh, we have his name as a... As, uh, Contributor, yeah. ...in a, a release. Um, he was a member of the IRA executive for many, many years. Oh, really? Mm. Are you doing classes? Is he still alive? I believe so, yeah. I believe so, yeah. 
There are very good lines out there that, that if they come in, I just, I, I'm just working hard for others trying to bring them in. We've managed to find some information on Alan Oliver. Well, my name is Alan and I oversee the Helping Hands Community Outreach Project, which is an integral ministry of Port of Nine Church. That's the man named in court papers as a UVF gunman. Our prayer is that you would support us in our efforts to reach the Port of Down Craigavon area in a relevant and practical manner with Jesus Christ as our role model. I want to have every bit of evidence in place before I go anywhere near Alan Oliver. If there was ever a time when you needed to have everything right, it, this is it. Now, as to its ultimate destination, from my point of view, it was destined to be of help to the family, as, as I've said, as victims of a foreign occupation. This is Patrick Ryan. The IRA had this former missionary priest essentially travelling around on their behalf, collecting money and weapons that were that was sustaining this armed campaign in Northern Ireland that just caused like destruction and mayhem. He spoke on camera briefly for a documentary for Thames Television. And he obviously was not directly admitting to anything that he had been involved in. And he didn't really kind of go into details of his backstory. And if I can get him to go on camera and tell his story, it would be pretty phenomenal. I'm going to drop down all these different books that I know that he's interested in. Um, and I, I, so that there's something to talk about with him. Very often when you're talking to people about sensitive topics, you don't launch in in terms of, oh, tell me about that, that IRA operation that you were involved in, that you had a hands-on role. You have to kind of dance around the subject. And when the source is ready to, to bring you into his or her world, if ever, you kind of have to wait to be invited in. So this dance has been going on for months and months and months. And every time I meet him, I get a little bit more. I'm hoping that he'll go on camera. Last time we were at the Cairns house, it was really to get to know them, to build relationships. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Good to see oh, you. Good to see you. You're right. You well? Yeah, doing well. How are you? We've come back this time because we're now ready to do an on-camera interview with them. Now, you know the way you were saying Sheila, that you were feeling a bit nervous. Yes. Well, no, yes. no, this is this is. I really need you to listen to me. When you start this interview, yes. you are only talking to me. Yes. There is nobody else in this room. Yes. You are telling me your story that you've waited so long to tell. Yes. This, is, this is your chance. Yes. Yes. This is about the boys. Mm -hmm. and you're doing it for them. Oh, I know I'm doing it for them. Yeah, good club there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Right. What would you say to people, Sheila, who would say, you gotta, you got to put a line in the sand? No. you got to move on for the sake no. of the greater good? No, there'll never be... Uh, there'll never be... Uh, not, uh, while I'm on Earth, no. I'll never, be, I'll, I'll never get peace. Never. I, I couldn't describe the... Uh, when they don't move, There's no movement. It mystifies you because they were so strong and full of life. And this deafening sound was now in your children. You know what? We'll take a wee break because you got me too.
understandably, it's something that they still feel, you know, fresh and raw pretty much every time. So we've just got to be very, very careful with them. Nearly claimed the wrong pump. Yikes, let me seriously. I'm properly demented today because I didn't get much sleep last night because I'm just really nervous about this meeting. The last time I met Paddy Wine, he said that he would do an interview, so I'm going down today to kind of discuss the parameters of what we would talk about um, ahead of a potential interview on Friday. I'm just afraid that he'll have had time last week to think about an interview and we'll just say, look, I'm just not going to do it. That happens a lot. Look, I just, I just need to stay calm. It is pressure. Can you send that on to me? Yeah, that, I understand that, I understand that. I won't say where they came from. Dara's back. Hello. And he's on his way to meet one of Hello. the yeah. people that appears in the film, an IRA member named Des Long. This is an ideal weapon for assault groups in close-up fighting, and it's a good weapon for street fighting. Hi, Des. I'm Dara. Dara. How are you? How are you? The very best. Mm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's yourself, isn't it? Okay. What was going on there? Can you talk us through the training camp? But what it really was was Bayer Bell wanted to make a film. And that's the Dublin unit. Members of the Dublin unit that are there. Why did you agree to take part in that back then? I did many a foolish thing. I was given a, a said he'd only filmed me from there down. All the rest of them were wearing face masks. But they didn't film me, that's the original. I know it is. That's by a Belfia. Now, this is <laughs> a collection of books. I mean, you've got hundreds of books, thousands of books here, do you? Thousands. There's quite a number of books here by Bayer Bell, actually. Borrow these glasses there. How about that? Irish Troubles, the Secret Army. Nice fella. I always felt he was an agent, but I thought it was American intelligence he was with. Did you actually think he was an agent back then? I did, yeah. I began making inquiries about Bell then, and I wasn't happy with him. What do you think? I mean, could this whole thing have been uh, fitted by intelligence to get all these people on board, to get footage of you, to get footage of other? Like, yeah, Martin yeah. McGuinness is caught. Well, like, there was Martin McGuinness, and he was able to operate and, and live in Derry. I wonder about that. What do you mean by that? I mean, let, let's face it, I was on the run, I couldn't appear my own door. And at least people could be at home. What are you thinking? <laughs> I, 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 bad thoughts. <laughs> you know, let's face it. Uh, you, you, you. It, 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 I never saw, I never saw that piece of it until you showed it me the other day. And uh, you certainly wouldn't make up a bomb in front of television and not be messed. You certainly wouldn't be taking out your revolver and taking out the rounds and showing them to kids and not being masked. It's crazy, that was. Maybe the whole film was crazy. Des Long did fall out with Martin McGuinness over the direction the Republican movement was taking in the 1980s. And it isn't really hard to find people who will insist, without any concrete evidence, 
that just about every other member of the Republican leadership was compromised by the British. But that said, this material with regard to Martin McGuinness is incriminating. And you can imagine what British intelligence might have done with it had they got their hands on it. I'm now talking to more people, former paramilitaries, security sources, who are placing Alan Oliver as a key suspect in murders right across Mid-Ulster. The encounter that I had with Jesus Christ changed for the better in a positive way. The path that I was on. He just looks like such a lovely man. That just incredible. The path that I am on now. And now, instead of my focus being against people, my focus is for people. So I'm going to put Alan Oliver at the centre. We're also going to do a version with just a silhouette and a question mark in case maybe we can't link him to all of these. I'll probably just do them chronologically. So Eileen Duffy, Brian Frizzell, Cortina Rennie. So that's the kind of earliest one that we have paperwork connecting. Alan Oliver too, that was in March 91. And then later that year is the heister deaths. And then I think it's the McCurneys. And then there's Charlie and Tess Fox. And then the Cairns. We have a scene investigating officer for these murders from the HEP teams. There were certain things that he would have picked up on, the certain patterns that he would have looked at during those particular investigations. In connection with suspects for... In connection with, with the Alan... Suspects, those suspects well, being responsible yeah, for those yeah, killings. Yeah. We've now made contact with a retired senior detective who was brought in by the historical inquiries team to review two of the Mid-Ulster cases we're looking at the murder of the McCurneys and the murder of Rory and Gerard Kearns. He is a very experienced investigator and he has never been interviewed by journalists about these killings before. He didn't name Alan Oliver in his reports, but can he tell us any more now? Alan uh, Oliver, he's, uh, he's named. Uh, in court documents uh, in connection with a number of, of killings. In the McCurney report, Alan Oliver was suspect too. He was never convicted of a murder. He was suspected in a lot of the cases of being a gunman in the Mid-Ulster UVS series. In terms of the Cairns case, can you just... Uh, what was, Al was Alan Oliver involved, do you think? Or is there anything you can say about him? Alan Oliver was not named in the uh, Cairns report. But since then, his name has now come into the public domain. My recollection is that Alan Oliver was one of the suspects that was, that was identified in the Cairns uh, murders. So now that Dave Hoare's confirmed the suspect is Alan Oliver, we can put our allegations to him. For the families, we have to do it. You couldn't have heard their testimony and, and not tried to get some closure, not tried to ask them the questions. I mean, you just couldn't. Before we can go to air, before we can make any allegations against anyone, we have to give them a very, very comprehensive right of reply. We have to basically put in writing every single allegation that we intend to make against them, and we have to give them the opportunity to refute each and every one of them. This is the BBC. There will be a battery of lawyers uh, and editors questioning me on every jot and tittle of this right of reply uh, to make sure that I've got it right and that I can stand over everything. It's a very rigorous process, and so it should be, because we're linking him to 15 murders. So the stakes are pretty high.
he's going to do it. Yeah? Yeah. It's going to head on Friday. What do you think you persuaded him to, to go on camera? Me? I'm just going to play, like, just, just watch this for a few minutes. Police are believed to want to question Patrick Ryan about 185 separate terrorist offences. He's also said to have visited Libya. Colonel Gaddafi's regime is one of the IRA's chief suppliers of weapons and explosives. So, if you're looking for somebody talking on camera, telling the secret history, he's one of those individuals. What else has he told you about the gun running? He openly says, I wasn't across the shipments in the late 80s. But he says that, at, to his mind, that at that stage, that British intelligence had total control of the IRA. Do you think he's got more to give on that? Or is it largely going to be his sort of, he's deduced from what happened? His analysis is separate to his first-hand experiences. Sure. So in terms of, you know, we have somebody in vision who was the link man between the IRA and Gaddafi. Yeah. You know, that itself... Is it, tremendous. ...is really good. Oh, yes, that famous little bit, yeah. <laughs> so this is when Margaret Thatcher met with Charles Hawhey. Out of the notes of that meeting... Yes. Six out of the eight pages are about you. Oh, there would be, yes. Oh, yeah. Which is only the tip of the iceberg, really, ultimately. Mm. Yeah. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher said, mm -hmm. from 1973 to 84, he was the main channel of contact with the Libyans. That's right. I mean, that was the only one. Mm. Spot on. Well, I was, yeah. But He's also you. been caught with bombing devices. Oh, of absolutely. The, of the sort that were nearly used on 11 of our seaside towns. That's right, and over 100, <laughs> over 100 other explosions in between the UK and the other islands. I think there's 108 or something. 108? <laughs> Explosions. <laughs> Why do you find that funny? Well, sure, I'll tell you, my answer to that would be, sure, if it's more profitable to cry, I'll cry. <laughs> I'll shed tears. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I suppose from a touristic point of view... Hey, Dave. Yeah, you are right. Do you have any regrets? Oh, I have, yes, big regrets. I regret that I wasn't even more effective. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'd like to have been much more effective. It's just so new and so fresh for people, and his honesty again, you know... Yeah. Just... It's arresting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because you you're not to, used to... Yeah. Like, everything now is kind of politically coated and... Yeah, of course. Kind of yeah. ..for consumption that... When somebody actually says, I, know. I don't have any regrets, I it's, wish I had done more. It's incredible. We finally got to the point where we've got something to show the BBC lawyer, David Atfield. All right, I'm going to go in then. Can I, you come in? Yep. He's come over from London to review our material on Alan Oliver. Yeah, my name's Alan Oliver. So it seems we've done a very calculated statement on YouTube, which is uh, intended to, I suppose, acknowledge his past without admitting or confessing fully to his past in a way which is going to land him into difficulty. That is not a video that he put up on YouTube. Uh, but it is him. But it is him. It's like a video for the church that he's part of. But OK, it's and not then secretly recorded. It's not it? secretly recorded, no. But okay, the, so, so maybe it wasn't yeah. intended for wider... But yeah. it was intended as... Mm -hmm. uh, was yeah, he's kind of absolving and explaining his past. Well, he's obviously he's struggling with his conscience now. Yeah, yeah. It appears that this man has genuinely embraced Christianity and uh, it is, by all accounts, quite a decent... Individual. Actually, my next door neighbour says in order to be genuine, you have to embrace your sins. Well, mm. that is what I'm going to say to him. That's our, isn't that going to be the, well, the, the line that we go to him on? Yeah. I've actually spent so much time, you know, looking at this, this man and what he's believed to have done. Um, 
it's actually quite nerve-wracking ringing him because it's like I've one chance and uh, I'm just worried. There's always that fear that you'll blow it, you know? It's a voice message. It's ringing. Hello, is that Alan? I'll tell you who I am. It's, um, my name's Mandy McCauley. I work for the BBC. All right, and that's, that's all you have to say. OK, thanks. Bye, bye. OK. He sounded quite defensive and quite nervous, and he was really taken aback and like, no comment, no comment. So I'm not necessarily disappointed. The chances that I was going to ring him and he was going to say, yeah, yeah, come on down for a cup of tea, were very slim. You know, w w I've done this, I've done this before. This is the first stage in a process, so I'm not downheartened by that at all. I got an email from um, Leon Gilden, who's the executive producer of Secret Army. Leon lives in Phoenix, Arizona. His job was to look after budgets and he helped sell the film after it was made. He wasn't actually out filming, but he knows a lot about the background. Mr. Golden. Yes. Lovely to meet you. Thank My you. Pleasure. Right. And we have a nice coffee prepared for you. Right. Well, thank you very much. Would, is that something? I would love one. Thank you yes. very much. From Gloria. Gloria Dara. Dara McIntyre. Lovely to meet Dara? you. Dara. Dara. Rhymes with Tara. Very pretty name. <laughs> thank Beautiful. You. Very nice. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Leo. Okay. Gentlemen. All right. Have you seen the film for a long while? When was the last time you saw no, it? No, I haven't seen the film in many years now. Do you want us to, would you mind, would you like to see a little bit of it again? Sure, I'd love to see it. Yeah. That's the target. That's the car going in. That's the target. So this is a real bomb being made up. Two policemen were slightly hurt by getting people cleared of the area after a warning. The bomb was between 20 and 30 pounds of explosive. The work is quite unique for well, all sorts of reasons. Well, of course, reasons. we didn't know that 47 years ago when we made it. We yeah. thought it was a pretty good documentary. But what happened after that, uh, I suppose we can discuss here today. It was my job to go out and try and sell it. And I went to a new company that had just been formed by the name of Viacom. And I showed it to them, and they loved it. And they immediately offered me a contract for worldwide rights. They prepared a lovely four-page brochure. Oh, wow. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I've certainly never seen that. At any rate, Viacom took it for worldwide rights and never sold a copy, not one copy. Viacom told me that the British Commonwealth countries were forbidden to show this film. What did Boyer Bell tell you about the British intelligence services and the footage? The rushes were sent down to be developed in London. In London, British intelligence, MI5, MI6, I don't recall which, would review the material to see whether they had captured anything that would be of interest to British intelligence or that British intelligence did not want shown. Are you certain of that? Is your recollection 100% on yes, that? Yes, that's my recollection. We've contacted MI5 and MI6, and they won't confirm or deny whether they knew anything about it. The makers of this film 
had unique access to the IRA. Even being allowed to film Martin McGuinness preparing a car bomb. The producer of the film used to work with the CIA. The executive producer of the film tells us that British intelligence saw every frame that was shot. Add those facts up and he could conclude that the secret army was one almighty gift for British intelligence. It's been two months since we wrote to Alan Oliver. There has been no reply. So we can now go to the next stage and that's called a doorstep. That means I can put questions directly to him on camera. This is the house that he lives at. Yeah, OK. It's basically a close, so the ability to get out is quite difficult. We could go and literally do the doorstep on the doorstep, knock the door, but a member of his family could come out and say he's not in. Yeah. And So the second option, I think, is actually the church. Doesn't um, really feel great, and um, doorstepping someone going to their yeah. place of worship. Yeah. The chances are that he'd come earlier. Than yes, he was just about to the... ask. He, do, he has some sort of a role in the church, doesn't yeah. he? Mm -hmm. So maybe he would mm -hmm. be there ahead of the whole congregation arriving to prep for whatever it is he does. I think this one's looking good. The uh, the furniture shop. This is the little road, and then there's a porter cabin here, and there's a shop there. And there's a little kind of car parky area here. So you'd have to have somebody maybe parked here to watch whether he opens and closes. What is the plan in your head? I identify myself, Mr. Oliver. It's Mandy McCauley from the BBC. I've been trying to contact you and then in with, you've been linked to a series of murders in Mid-Ulster and then I start showing them the photographs. It doesn't matter how many of these you do, there's always that fear that you'll get out of the car and you'll, when you open your mouth, nothing will come out. No, I, listen, I won't blank, I'll be fine. We're almost at the location, we are three minutes away. I hope he comes. Leave enough space behind you so as if somebody parks in front of us, we can still get out. Okay. I hate this anxiety, I hate this level of uh, adrenaline. Okay, we, we'll wait then until near three, yeah? Yep. I just need patience now. I actually get to the stage where I go, maybe if we just give it a wee bit longer. We've sat here five hours. Six. Not today. Not today. Yeah, sure, what else would you rather be doing at half five? Half past five in the morning. What time's the church service at? I just want it done now. I just want I just want it over. Gwyneth, we are now down near the church. Okay, no problem. I'll talk to you later on then. Brian, thanks for Cheers. Bye bye. Well half six has come and gone and um, there's no sign of life at the church. It's not gonna happen. I'm hoping we're gonna be allowed to keep going until we can can we can confront them. I was really hopeful for this morning. I think this is the hardest doorstep I have ever done. Uh, what's that van in front of us? Oh, wait, Zed. And that's it. That's it? That's it. That's him. That's him. That's him. Shit. Okay. He's going to go. You go. Don't is everything go. plugged? Yeah. He's going right in. OK, Mandy, you ready? You turn the car and come after us. Mr. Oliver? My name's Mandy McCauley. I'm from the BBC. I want to ask you about a series of murders that were carried out across Mid-Ulster. You have been connected by multiple sources, by intelligence, to a series of murders across Mid-Ulster. Did you murder these people, Mr. Not. Oliver? Why will you not talk to us, Mr. Oliver? Do you remember? You're placed at the scene. They were shot at point-blank range. Mr. Oliver, why won't you talk to us? You are linked to multiple murders, Mr. Oliver. 
Alan Oliver obviously has very, very serious questions to answer. Um, he obviously doesn't want to answer them this morning. Okay, let's go. My heart is actually going like a train. At some stage, he is going to have to answer to somebody. After two years' work, the series is finally going to air. It's 821, the second in the BBC Spotlight series, The Troubles of Secret History is on tonight. These revelations have made the front pages of some of the uh, local papers. Thanks, bye-bye. Laura, will you ring Jeremy on your mobile, please, and read, read that email to him? And the result of a huge amount of work by the Spotlight team. Jennifer O'Leary, thank you. Uh, Spotlight stands by its journalism, and people should watch this programme and follow it. It'll be something like that. People might be saying, you know, why are you digging this over again? Why are you going back here when we're, you know, society is still trying to come to terms with the past? Well, if you don't understand the past, you're bound to, I think, repeat the mistakes of the past. And that's why these programs are important. I think it's really important that these stories were put out there because you know, doesn't society deserve to find out the truth? Very often, it's only when you hear from somebody whose views you don't agree with that you can try and understand and pick apart what happened. We've been on a journey over two years with these families. You know, these are people you know, who spent decades looking for the truth, waiting, hoping, never giving up. Yesterday, I spent yesterday, you know, going around the families. I mean, I can't actually put into words how nerve wracking that was because I just, I didn't want to let them down. And they kept saying, look, just give it to us straight. We just want the truth. I think they were just pleased that we have taken it forward, that we have found new evidence that some of these cases may now be reopened. <laughs> 